very generous introduction. I'm sorry I could not be here for the earlier sessions because um, I was in Kolkata giving a memorial lecture for uh, um, an economist who had worked on, uh, who was very well known for having worked on long-term trends of real wages in India starting from 1857 up to the 1950s. So in some respects his work paralleled that of uh, Jürgen Kuczynski, the famous uh, German economic historians, the former GPR, who had this monumental study of labor conditions under industrial capitalism, of which one of the volumes also covered India. Now, I'm sure that uh, in the Center for uh, Informal and, uh, what is it? Labor Studies? Mm -hmm. You would be given this reference to Jurgen Kuczynski. I hope people haven't forgotten him. <clears throat> and what I have to say, perhaps, would have been best said in an initial session rather than in a valedictory one. But anyway, uh, let me just try to quickly go through. Uh, I have a written paper, but it's a little too long. I'll start by reading from it because that saves time, but then I'll sort of depart from that a little later. The classical discussion of the agrarian question was premised on an accepted narrative regarding the path of industrialization followed first by Britain and generalized to Western Europe. This narrative spoke first of the breakup of feudal relations of production in the European heartland, with the debate turning on the relative causative importance of internal contradictions within the disintegrating feudal system on the one hand, and the impact of long distance uh, trade, the famous transition debate. Secondly, this narrative assumed that industrial capitalism was necessarily predicated on the displacement of peasant petty production, uh, peasant petty producers from the land. The conversion of these producers into a class of propertyless, wage dependent workers. And it was predicated also on the consolidation of land into larger, more productive units under emerging capitalist tenant farms, which is supposed to have induced a successful agricultural revolution in course. Thirdly, this narrative, the accepted narrative, also assumed that the unemployment of displaced peasants was only a transitional problem, and they would be absorbed eventually, partly into capitalist agriculture, but mainly into fast expanding factory production. This narrative was widely accepted by academics in developing countries too, as not only providing a correct perspective on industrial transition in history, but also as providing a suggested map for the developing countries in the global south that had recently emerged from their colonial status into independence. In other words, we all thought that this was the path that we would also follow. Subsequent academic work has followed this accepted narrative in its broad outlines, while deviating from it only to stress the particularities of the transition in different countries. From Moore's talk to Robert Brenner and to more recent writings, including by my friend Terence Byers, the question of transition from a mainly agrarian economy in Europe has been viewed as being driven by a purely internal dynamic with the destruction of small-scale peasant production as a necessary condition of this development and this dynamic. Above all, these authors have never at any point integrated the reality of the possession by the West European powers of first colonies and then empire into their narrative, a reality that was actually crucial in diffusing the class tensions arising from internal displacement and pauperization. I too was persuaded by the dominant discourse for many years before realizing that it was seriously flawed. This is a realization that emerged from studying the history of trade and industrial growth in Britain, which indicated a very close economic link with the transfers it enjoyed from its largest colony, India. I found that the accepted trade theory, deriving from Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage, 
was based on a factually incorrect assumption that all countries could produce all goods. This fallacious theory is taught uncritically to this day and no doubt will continue to be taught for the next two centuries as in the past two centuries, not only in northern universities but in the global south. And this is because our intellectual life, I believe, is completely hegemonized by the theories emanating from the law, however absurd they might be when considered dispassionately and objectively. We daily commit another fallacy that Aristotle talked about, the fallacy at Verikundia, that is the appeal to all rather than to rational argument. External sources of primitive accumulation and massive international migration from Europe have never ever been related to its successful industrial transition. I believe that the problems faced by the peasantry in the global south today cannot be understood within the, this accepted narrative that by ignoring colonial transfers in the past and new imperialism in the present, thereby ignores the reasons for the present day continuing thrust of northern countries using new free trade regimes and income deflating policies to access the products of the global south. So let me start, this is by way of introduction, let me start the first section with um, uh, sort of iconoclastic discussion of the so-called agricultural revolution in the first industrial country, Britain. The striking feature of the transition to capitalism in Western Europe during the 18th, 19th centuries is the drive to acquire primary resources from uh, distant lands, first through normal trade and later through conquest. In academic writings from northern universities informed by a Marxist perspective, even those informed by a Marxist perspective, I should say, the question was never asked why the Europeans found it necessary to undertake external primitive accumulation through armed expansion beyond their own national borders, followed either by the complete expropriation of small producers beyond their borders or their political subjugation as a prelude to extraction of slave rent or taxes from them. The limited primary resource base in Europe and the inability of their populations to produce a range of goods producible abroad in countries like ours has been completely ignored. Indeed, mainstream trade theory is based on the explicit and factually incorrect assumption, as I mentioned already, that all countries could produce all primary goods. So the thrust of the standard accepted narrative has been always on the internal sources of primitive accumulation. That is the displacement of small-scale production, the formation of a proletariat, the rise of assumedly efficient large-scale capitalist production. I say assumedly efficient because actually, as we shall see, they were not efficient at all. I do not deny that long-distance trade was discussed at length, for example, by Dobb, uh, in, 1940, in his 1946 book, Studies in the Development of Capitalism, but even Dobb discussed it only in terms of high profit rates for mon monopoly trading companies. <coughs> there is no discussion at all of the much more lucrative source arising from conquest, namely using colonial budgetary revenues to purchase export goods in India, or importing goods that embodied slave rent from the Caribbean colonies. So that the rising trade deficit of Britain with these regions created no external payment liability for it, unlike its trade with sovereign countries. Transfers in commodity form of slave rent, land rent, taxes, or a combination of the last two, as in Ireland, were very large indeed. I had estimated earlier that the transfer from Asia and the West Indies taken together during the period 1780 to 1820, the period of the first industrial revolution range from 5.5% to 6% of Britain's GDP and it amounted to 70 to 80% of its capital formation out of internal domestic savings. Now, there are two actually completely separate aspects as regards the discussion of internal primitive accumulation of capital. The first is the class structure altering aspect of the process. And the second is the alleged rise in productivity, that is the so-called agricultural revolution. 
required for supplying food and raw materials with the shift of labor towards factory production. While the social changes brought about by the redistribution of the land were undoubtedly as described by Marx and later by Mantu, Tony, the Hamlins, and so on, producing a new class of landless workers through displacement, the narrative on higher productivity actually departs from facts. <coughs> higher productivity did not take place. In reality, in England, there was absolute decline of grain production per head of population. And therefore, the availability of bread, the main wage good, declined after 1750 for eight decades. And this was precisely the period of transition to capitalist farming. Now, Isa Shinti will be very familiar with my argument because I have presented it um, and at Dar es Salaam where he had invited me many years ago and it is also available in the book that I co-authored along with him and with Sam Moyo, which some of you may have seen. So precisely the period of transition to capitalist farming which is supposed to have been seen high rise in productivity in Britain did not see anything of that kind. And the raw material for industrial revolution, raw cotton, was of course entirely imported. Over the entire 18th century, we find, and I'm referring here to a number of studies, empirical studies of agricultural production in Britain which have been carried out uh, since the 1960s. The original ones, of course, was Chambers and Mingi, 1966, the Agricultural Revolution, 1750 to 1880. I used to teach my students in CSP in the early years after this. But later on, there's been an extensive debate in the pages of the Economic History Review as well as online by contributions by people like R.C. Allen, Tracking the Agricultural Revolution in England is the title of his paper in the Economic History Review, uh, volume 42, number 2. Then we have G. Clark, 2002. The Agricultural Revolution and the Industrial Revolution, England, 1500 to 1912, which I accessed online from the UC Davis uh, portal. Then we have, <clears throat> of course, um, a paper by three authors, Turner, Beckett, and Afton, 2001. Farm production in England, 1700 to 1914, which came out from the Cambridge University Press. And these people have been having, or oh, some of them have been carrying out a debate uh, with others who have maintained that there has been a uh, substantial rise in productivity, even though the latter give figures which show that this is not the case. Now, I looked in detail at the output figures as far as uh, uh, cereals and food grains were concerned and over the entire 18th century in Britain there was only a 43% rise in cereal output whereas the alternative population estimates we give show a larger rise in population than in cereal output. So we have an actual decline in cereal output per capita from 12.5% ranging from 12.5% to 17.5% between 1750 to 1800. Now, what the decline was depends on which population series I take. Whether I take Mod Madison series, or whether I take um, Lee and Schofield series, or whether I take another earlier series. Absolute wheat output per head of population in Britain was estimated, and this is not over the entire population, because the entire population did not consume wheat and bread but only the portion that actually consumed wheat and bread. The output per head of wheat consuming population was 223 kilograms in 1750, which fell to only 168 kilograms by 1800, while there was a slight rise by 1850 to 190 kilograms. But this is still far below that of developing countries today. It is below the average for the least developed countries today. Despite all allegedly productivity raising transition to capitalist agriculture, Britain failed to feed its population. Little wonder then that the cry for cheap bread became the principal political economy demand of the working class for many decades starting from the 1790s. We know that obdurate landlords using the corn laws to prevent import 
Combined with rapid wartime food price inflation, this is the Napoleonic Wars, and bad harvest in the 1790s, reduced the rioting working class to starvation, actually starvation. And France also saw the same trends of mass hunger. British Britain's grain imports increased fivefold over the five decades to 1855, despite the Corn Laws, which were not repealed until 1846. By which date, by the mid 19th century, its imports of all primary products by value was more than its entire domestic primary sector output. Uh, history has never seen such a huge import dependence as in the case of industrializing Britain. But do their economists draw these conclusions? No. They give you the figures for food output, they give you the figures for population, they simply don't take the final step of dividing one by the other to see what was happening, happening to per out. That's the only thing I have done. I've taken their own figures. I've just done a simple division over time. Now, how could it afford to import more than it actually produced in the primary sector? Which country can afford to do that today, even today? Imports of primary products exceeding its domestic output was only possible because most of the imports represented tax finance transfers from its colonies. George Wingate, who had set up the land revenue system in Bombay Presidency in 1818, had deplored the tribute, he called it tribute, that India was forced to pay every year to Britain. From 1765 onwards, one third, at least one and quarter, one quarter, and up to one third of net budgetary revenues, that is, net of collection costs, was not spent within the country, but set aside as expenditure abroad for purchasing export goods from the local Indian peasants and artisans who had paid in the taxes in the first place. That is, they were purchased their goods out of their own tax contribution. So even though they appeared to be paid, they were not actually paid. This was the clever thing about the market mechanism that even to the people who were being exploited, the exploitation was not clear or evident. Because there was a market exchange, you know. You were given your uh, export goods, your cotton textiles, your rice, your salt pito, or whatever, and you were actually getting money in exchange. So it appeared as an exchange of equivalents. But they did not know that the money was coming out of taxes that had been extracted from them. So all that was happening is that the mere form of the tax changed from cash to goods, from cash to export commodities. So it became costless for Britain. It did not create no external liability for Britain at all. In the West Indies, costless imports were embodied in slave rent, not in taxes so much. This was the excess of the output of net material costs over the bare subsistence, uh, sorry, uh, the excess of output, net of material costs over the bare subsistence of the enslaved labor. While in Ireland, tenants subsisted on cheap potatoes while rent plus taxes extracted from them were embodied in exports of wheat and animal products to Britain, which served to feed uh, most of the urban population's consumption of wheat and animal products actually came from Irish imports. Now, many years ago I had written a paper finding out, finding that an inverse relation always emerged between exports of primary products from countries like ours and from Ireland and domestic consumption, that the more of primary products were successfully exported, the lower was the consumption level of our populations. Now, this is not inevitable. If you put in enough investment to raise agricultural productivity, in theory you can do both. You can export more and you can also maintain domestic consumption. But the colonial government was really not interested in uh, maintaining local consumption levels. Very little investment was put in to raise productivity. So the sown area of tropical land remained virtually fixed. That is, the ratio of gross sown to net sown area hardly went down. But it was made to provide increasing volumes of foodstuffs and raw materials to the industrializing world. This always led to declining grain supply for the domestic population. Now, in some cases, the grain uh, production increased, like in Korea. It was made to increase under Japanese colonialism quite substantially. But the local supply for the local population went down because by the 1930s, 
More than half of total Korean grain output was being exported to Japan. So that is the inverse relation. The more these colonies exported, the poorer their own populations became. And of course, a major, a very important index of this increase in poverty was simply a reduction in their nutritional standards. The global north grew 10 times faster than food grains, which were also exported. And per capita grain availability declined from around 200 kilograms in 1900 to 137 kilograms by 1946. Similar decline took place in Java under the Dutch and in Korea under Japan. I've given all the data for these uh, countries in the book I published in 2007 and 8, The Republic of Hungary. And this inverse relation is very important because the reason that the today's advanced countries actually wanted access to our lands, that reason has not gone away. There will not be some miracle by which uh, North America, Canada, Northern Europe can manage to produce, uh, they of course produce sufficient grain, they have a huge glut of grain now, the productivity has risen enormously, but there's an enormous range of products that this simply can, cannot, could not produce then, cannot produce now, and will never be able to produce, because the climatic conditions do not permit it. And this blatant material reality is something that is ignored completely in the whole of economic theory, including I regret to say, in Marxist economic theory. Because I have not come across a single Marxist, starting from Karl Marx himself, who recognized this material reality. Now why not? Please don't ask me. That is a very complex question. It has to do with the fact that our intellectual formation is determined by what we read and what we absorb from others. We don't know everything all at once. Okay? And even Marxists in advanced capitalist countries are brought up on a kind of economic history and a kind of uh, presentation of facts which really departs completely from reality. And then of course they exercise such enormous hegemony over our own universities that even when you point out that look, the Ricardian theory is wrong because it's making a wrong material assumption, there's a fallacy in it. People will not have the courage to say that yes, it is wrong. They will say it in private over a coffee table to you, but they will never say it in writing because of, uh, again, you know, we are all subject to this kind of agenda. Now, the reason I'm saying the inverse relation is so important is because this particular reason for the global supply chain which has developed at present, the entire WTO discipline, the whole of the policies that North America and Northern Europe follow, vis-a-vis -vis the developing world, vis-a-vis -vis the global south, simply cannot be understood unless we understand this basic material reality that as far as primary products are concerned, there is an asymmetry. Uh, the global south is far more productive than the global north is. It has always been so and in the foreseeable future it will remain so. Because no amount of global warming in the foreseeable future is going to allow Belgium to produce bananas or Canada to produce coffee. Okay. They will always be dependent for a huge range of products, which are now by now essential for their consumption basket on the global south. Uh, okay, I'm not doing too badly in terms of time, so uh, let me just say that colonial trade is downplayed in the metropolitan literature. I have pointed out again and again, and I will point out again today that uh, a very well-known book on British economic growth by Reed and Cole gives you wrong estimates of British trade because the leave out re-exports completely. Now, no international agency which prepares statistics of trade, whether it's the United Nations, uh, Trade and uh, ACTAP, a conference on trade and development, or whether it is the World Bank, whether it is the IMF, you look at the trade data, Trade is always defined as total imports plus total exports and then expressed as a ratio of GDP. Total imports will include imports which are later on re-exported perhaps. Not all countries re-export, but the colonizing countries always re-exported a very large proportion of their imports because tropical goods represented for them international purchasing power. None of the North American and Northern European countries could produce these goods, tropical goods. So there was a ready market for these goods. A bag of pepper was equivalent to a purse full of gold 
We had no, uh, they had no problem finding markets for the exports. It was the same as gold, you know. Um, so they had very large re-exports. And yet you find, uh, and these re-exports need to be included because they were exchanged just as your domestic exports are exchanged for imports of food grains, raw materials and other things, uh, energy and so on from other countries. Similarly, the re-exports purchase goods from other countries. So that it's conceptually correct to include it in trade. But even gold excluded it, and if you look at the, the series of what they call the volume of British trade, the figures are wrong. Because they've exported, they've uh, taken out re-exports completely. I'll just give you an example that by the three years centered on 1801, Dean and Cole had found uh, Britain's trade to amount to only 51 million pounds, or 36% of British GDP. But it's the correct figure when we include re-exports, when we apply the same definition as is applied today by all international organizations, the correct figure is 82 million pounds, not 51 million pounds. And the correct trade to GDP ratio is not 36%, but 58%. So their estimates are off by a huge magnitude. So we have to look at what they're doing with their figures, not only in the past, but also today. Because I will very briefly talk about poverty estimates where you see that the way figures are used and presented uh, is really something that no self-respecting academic should be prepared to accept. And that is true today uh, of today's data. It is not just true of historical data. So, what is the upshot of my alternative perspective? It was not a more productive domestic capitalist agriculture that satisfied growing food and raw material requirements. Unlike the Jeju's accounts in the standard works, it was primarily tax financed, slave rent financed, and land rent financed transfers from the colonies, including Ireland. As the transfers increased, famines became endemic. Because as we have seen, since there was very little uh, investment to raise productivity, basically these goods were being squeezed out by increased extraction of economic surplus, by driving down local populations to lower and lower consumption levels, in some years resulting in actual famine. India suffered several famines of very great severity, culminating in the great 1943-44 Bengal famine, while one eight, twelve and a half percent of Ireland's population perished in the Great Famine of 1846-7, even as wheat exports to England continued. Now, we find no reference at all to India or to Ireland by leading economic historians. There is no reference in Maurice Law, who was my uh, supervisor in Cambridge and who I respect very greatly. There is no re reference in Robert Brenner, in the Brenner debate at all to Ireland, not even to Ireland, leave alone to tropical colonies. There is no uh, there is just one sentence in Eric Hobson, but there is no re reference to colonial transfers from uh, India, even in Eric Hobson, uh, in industry or empire or several books that he wrote. There is no reference to the Indian discussion on the of wealth. So in their, uh, you know, idealized world of these authors, it appears that lord, peasant and merchant played out their roles as though colonial exploitation of today's global south or of Ireland simply did not exist. It never existed and they do not need to take any account of it. Now, there are also very important issues raised which are broadly ignored by the actual history of capitalism uh, and the whole question of associating capitalism with free wage labor as contrasted with serfdom and slavery and the pre-capitalist modes of production. Now, as we know, capitalism as an economic system is supposed to be based on free wage labor. Free in the dual sense mentioned by Marx, that the laborer himself does not belong to anybody, nor does he possess anything of his own with which to reproduce his life. So he's free in both senses, floating worker who has to sell his labor power for wages. But is it really true that capitalism, the rise of capitalism was associated with free wage labor alone? Certainly it was associated in Europe with free wage labor. But in reality, the revival of modern slavery over a thousand years after the slavery of the ancient world was the dubious gift of the rise of the capitalist mode of production. The same 18th and 19th century French and English landlords who leased out their land by contract 
to capitalists and farmers in their own home countries and obtained capitalist wealth. These same people operated plantations based on slave labor in the Caribbean to extract slave rent. The founding fathers of um, uh, the United States of America, of course, were also slave owners. And slavery was widely prevalent in the area that we know as Boston and the Narragansett Bay area today where you know, it disappeared earlier than it did in the south, but it was widely prevalent at that time. So does it follow that it is incorrect to associate the rise of capitalism with the freedom of the worker? No. For free wage labor is an indisputable fact in the core countries of capitalism. But so is lack of freedom imposed on peripheral populations. We are part of the periphery as far as the capitalist world is concerned. I'm alternating with different sorts of terminology. I don't think it's very important. Everyone understands what the global south is, what the cap capitalist periphery is, and so on. I don't have to take very seriously uh, David Harvey's uh, objection that we haven't defined what a underdeveloped country is or you know, what a country in the global south is. Uh, as we said in our book, that look, uh, John Robinson had made a famous remark that you can always define in one sentence a point in mathematics, but you cannot define in one sentence an elephant. But that doesn't really matter because when you look at an elephant, you know it's an elephant. Unless you happen to be blind. If you can't see at all, you won't know it's an elephant. Yeah, she actually made this comment and it's very true. The Marxist analysis of the relation between the growth of free wage labor at one pole, of capitalist accumulation, and of chattel slavery at the other pole, is an analysis which is yet to be undertaken. It must take into account the dialectical interaction of these two antithetical forms of exploitation. The freedom of workers, I believe, in the poor countries was historically conditional on the imposition of unfreedom on non-European people. The capitalist ruling classes impose servitude on many non-European peoples, forcibly removed them from their communities, enslaved and transported millions of persons to the other side of the globe to work plantations for their own benefit. They treated slave rent as profit. After the formal abolition of slavery, another form of unfreedom continued under the indentured labor system. At the same time, the capitalist ruling classes bowed in their home countries to the pressure of struggles by wage labor for political rep representation like in the reform acts that were passed in Britain and economic improvement through collective bargaining. The bargaining power of wage labor in the core countries necessarily improved through the dual route of outbreak migration of the unemployed, I'll talk about that in a moment, which reduced the domestic reserve army of labor in the core countries and the massive inflow of colonial transfers which boosted domestically generated profits and served to raise living standards. Now it's an interesting thing that when you look at uh, you know, the migration, the question of migration and the question of slavery and followed by the question of migration of not only from uh, Africa but also from China and uh, India for example to work uh, plantations in Mauritius, uh, in the West Indies, uh, in Guyana, and so forth. Um, you find that um, uh, W. Arthur Lewis, who had that famous uh, model on unlimited supply of labor at a constant wage rate, right? Um, and who also is the only leading economic historian to have explicitly talked about two different and parallel streams of migration. One stream of migration which went from uh, the European countries of their domestic populations to the regions of new settlement in North America, in Australia, in Argentina, uh, South Africa, and so on. And the other stream of migration, which was an induced or forced migration, uh, which consisted of uh, people who were obliged to migrate from Africa, from China, uh, from India, uh, from other Southeast Asian countries, to work the plantations which were set up by the white settlers in the regions of new settlement. So he talks about these two streams of migration. But the interesting thing is that in all his writings, there is no mention of slavery. In all the talk about migration, there is no mention of the transportation of slaves. 
Now, W. Arthur Lewis here was from the Caribbean. He was possibly the only Caribbean economist to hold a prestigious chair uh, in, uh, in England. And uh, maybe it was a kind of psychological block. He talked rather pejoratively about uh, Chinese coolies and Indian coolies and how low their living standards were and how they were prepared to go abroad for a pittance. And he fallaciously gave the idea or put forward the argument that Europeans would never migrate for such a pittance as Chinese and Indian coolies. Why? Because he said the European productivity was higher, the product wage was higher in Europe. Completely wrong argument, but I don't have time to go into that. Basically, again, an incorrect statement of material reality. He said that European productivity was higher. As, as a matter of fact, to this day, European productivity or even American productivity, American agriculture is more productive than uh, European agriculture. Uh, the Chinese produce three times per hectare as much as uh, USA does. Even India produces 52% more per hectare than the USA does. So this, you know, even our leading and uh, respected uh, economic historians suffer from this kind of being hegemonized completely by a narrative which flows from an incorrect statement of material facts, which are easy to establish, which in the case of Britain is something that the British empirical estimators themselves have established. I'm simply using their figures to arrive at the decline in per capita um, uh, output. Now, uh, the alternative perspective I'm talking about uh, is the unfettered outmigration of Europeans on a large scale to the lands they have seized from indigenous peoples in the Americas and elsewhere. Is there a problem with the sound? You can't hear me? Oh, that is a problem. I don't think that's very essential. It? It's a bit distracting for me to have this in front of me as a matter of fact. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah, the complement to this outmigration of Europeans was the creation of a bloated reserve army of labor in the subjugated countries as a consequence of resource transfers through such colonial exploitation. It is these features which allowed the industrializing nations to externalize the acute internal contradictions which would otherwise have torn their societies apart and served to undermine the potential for revolution at the core while at the same time the conditions were generated for a shifting of the locus of struggle to the global south. So there are very important uh, conclusions one can draw from the alternative perspective. Historically in the poor capitalist countries, many millions more were displaced than were ever absorbed into non-agricultural activities within the boundaries of these countries. And um, I will quickly go on to say that for a century after 1821, again this is a figure I have very often given, but I will hammer away at it again and again, more persons migrated from Britain, Britain had a small population. Uh, in 1821, the population including Scotland uh, was around 14 million maximum. But we are, not, we are talking about Britain, not the United Kingdom. We are not talking about Irish migration at all. So from Britain alone, uh, the, for a century after that, roughly about half the increment to population migrated permanently outside. Because they had a place to go to. They had North America to go to. They had Australia to go to. Uh, they had South Africa to go to. They had Argentina to go to. They had New Zealand to go to. Okay. Uh, and they went to places where they acquired more property in terms of primary and other resources than they had ever commanded in their home country. I made a little calculation that if we had the same rate of our migration after we became independent, up to today, more than 400 million Indians would have left the country permanently by now. But the actual Size, yeah, because if you take half the increment of population every year, it's quite a simple calculation. But the actual size of the Indian uh, settlers of Indian uh, origin abroad, about five years ago was 17 million. By now, how much would it be? Certainly not more than 20 million. Compared to about 20 times that in relative terms that Britain exported abroad. So again, the 
this whole question of massive out-migration is really not discussed when we talk about uh, the process of capitalist industrialization and their rise to power in the core capitalist countries. Why not? Why is this not integrated in any way? Uh, and it is only now that slowly some of the Marxists are beginning to understand the importance of this and they are beginning to integrate this. I hope that's not a plane crash somewhere. Rather, rather alarming. So let me quickly go on. And how many minutes do I have? Another five minutes? Ten minutes? Yes. Roughly? Yes. We started about uh, late. Yes. Yeah. Alright. So let me quickly go on to modern times. We know that the gravest problems which face developing economies today, including ours, are unemployment and declining nutritional standards for the masses. And both are endemic to capitalism as an economic system. Exceptions have arisen because of the specific circumstances which I've been discussing so far, which are really not recognized properly in the literature. <laughs> developing countries do not have the options today that Europeans used in the past albeit in a ruthless manner to overcome the same problems in their own countries. After gaining independence, developing countries protected their agriculture and this, that stabilized their incomes to some extent. But this ended, as you know, with the inception of neoliberal reforms which involved a decline in state expenditure and renewed free trade. External demands on developing countries' present producers were revived in even more intensive form via the transnational agribusiness companies and the new world trade regime, which is constantly battling them to open up even more to free trade and to dismantle whatever little subsidies they give, meager subsidies they give to their own uh, populations. And this, of course, we cannot understand. Excuse me, I have a very bad throat. So, even to continue for another five or seven minutes, this was necessary. We simply cannot understand this incessant badgering which goes on in the WTO and other fora without understanding that getting access to our products is essential for their survival. Without that, actually, the living standards will really collapse. Now, in our own countries, unfortunately, our governments have given in to pressure over time. Slowly, in fact, we are in a, a highly trade liberalized situation now, and there's been periodic cutbacks on state funding of investment, particularly in the agrarian sphere. So, under this regime of sharp cutbacks in state funding on investment in rural development, it has been found impossible to maintain per capita green availability in our countries as well as supply the growing demands of the global north. Now, if we did not have these cutbacks in investment, if we were aware of the danger from the beginning, and if we had enormously stepped up our investment in agriculture, we could have perhaps done more. We could have filled supermarket shelves abroad in Europe and North America, and we could have maintained a modicum of food security for our own population. But I don't think any of our policymakers and leading economists really took the inverse division at all seriously nor did they plan for it. So that is why we find that while under the protectionist regime from 1950 to 1990, per capita food availability in India had risen quite substantially, though still not back to the 1900 level, under the new trade open regime since then, since 1990, it has declined sharply and at present it is at the same level as in 1937. Okay, so we have lost all the gains. The advanced country's capitalist agricultural production is highly inefficient by global standards, but then it is sustained by massive state subsidies every year. In the US it amounts to half or more of the value of the entire farm output. And of course they can do this because they've uh, shifted most of their subsidies into what they call green box and so forth, which are not subject to WTO reduction commitments. So they decide what is reducible, what is not reducible. And their subsidies are not reducible, but our subsidies. That is the uh, long and short of the matter. 
In developing countries like ours, the real facts of rising unemployment and declining nutrition for the masses have been camouflaged behind figures of high GDP growth rates and completely spurious claims of decline in poverty. We know that material the material productive sectors in our country, like uh, agriculture and industry, that contribution to GDP now provides below two-fifths, whereas the services sector has ballooned and uh, it provides more than uh, three-fifths, compared to um, about a third a few decades ago. Reliable official data from the LSSO have shown that per capita energy intake measured in kilocalories per day and protein intake have been declining. The only thing that has been rising is fat intake heavily concentrated in the rich. And uh, calorie and protein intake has been declining faster in villages than in towns. With trade liberalization, farmers exposed once again as in the colonial period to price volatility have again fallen into the debt trap and mainly as a result of cumulative debt and this is a figure all of you know by heart by now more than 3 lakh farmers have already committed suicide since 1997. We find from the land ownership data that the concentration of land ownership has increased substantially with loss of assets against debt and near forcible acquisition of productive agricultural land by corporate interests facilitated by the state which has, of course, in recent years, induced waves of farmer protests. Technological change in manufacturing has meant that the positive growth of manufacturing output is nowadays in many sectors producing negative growth of employment. So we really have no chance within the existing trajectory of development of solving our employment, our unemployment and food security problems. As far as the poverty estimates are concerned, you know, we find that uh, the reason I call them spurious is because in order to compare any variable over time or any statistical result over time, the definition by, of a poverty line has to remain constant. I mean, you have to use the same definition. But after the base year, that definition was changed, whereas the base year poverty line, not only in our country, in China as well as other countries, was linked to uh, access to a minimum level of nutrition, that link was snapped in later years. And uh, effectively the definition was changed without any of us being told it was changed. Because the new poverty lines were simply now not on the basis of looking at what is the expenditure a person makes per month which will allow him or her to access a minimum nutritional level. The new definition was simply one which took the 1973 poverty line and applied a consumer price index to our data. Now, as I've been writing repeatedly, uh, and I have actually, you know, uh, looked at what the poverty line should have been if we had continued with the original definition, which is the correct thing to do, that uh, the new definition led to very substantial and cumulative underestimation of the official poverty line in time. Every five years, you are giving an underestimated line. The next, after five years later, on the basis of that underestimated poverty line, you are again underestimated it in Uganda by 2005. In fact, if I uh, remember correctly, uh, the rural poverty line was something probably like uh, uh, 12 rupees a day or something absurd like that. And there were some noted colleagues of ours who were econometricians who had written a paper in Economic and Political Weekly a very positive paper saying extreme poverty has disappeared in many states, including in states like Punjab and Andhra. And when you look at how they define extreme poverty, it is people who are below half the poverty line. Now, in Andhra Pradesh, the rural poverty line at that time was 9 rupees per day. Half the rural poverty line was 4.5 rupees per day. So it was not extreme poverty which had disappeared. The reason that you had no observations below four and a half rupees is that people were dead at that level of spending. No one gets the money. So you have a gross misinterpretation of the data and it's sort of mechanical interpretation, a mechanical calculation every five years. Then since some of us started making a noise, an activist, lawyers started making a noise, uh, the 
the new community was set up, it did really nothing. It only raised the rural poverty line by one sixth. It made no difference to the estimates. Um, then after that, we have had the latest uh, 2014 Rangarajan committee being set up. But unfortunately, the entire thrust of the attempt of revising poverty lines and arriving at poverty uh, est uh, estimates seems to be how can we show poverty in uh, good light? How can we show the government in a relatively good light? By not producing a poverty line which gives a huge estimate of poverty, but at the same time making sure that it is not so uh, impossibly low that people are going to criticize us. So a search for the golden mean. I almost think that the fix from the poverty ratio first and then determine what the poverty line should be and then decided that all this business of poverty level basket and so on that the Rangarajan committee talks about. But even so, uh, the figures they arrive at are really still quite absurd. For example, for 2011-12, I think um, the Rangarajan committee is uh, a poverty line is amount to um, 47 rupees per day in urban areas and 33 rupees a day in rural areas. That is supposed to be all costs, not just food, but your daily requirements of utilities, of medicine, of education, everything. Which is really completely impossible and in fact it's a miracle that there are people found to be living below this. Something like almost a third of the population still is living below such terribly uh, low levels of the and uh, manipulated low levels of the poverty line. The true poverty line are more than governments. And the true poverty estimates would indicate that by 2011 12, two thirds of the population, both a little more than two thirds actually, 68% of the population, both in rural and, Indian, uh, and urban India, were in poverty, taking the original norms of 2200 calories per day in rural and 2100 in urban. Original was 2400 but in 1973 they didn't apply that, they applied 2200. Randar Island Committee has arrived at lower estimates because it has explicitly reduced the calorie norms to uh, 2155 in rural areas and um, 2019 in urban areas. Uh, you may say it's a small reduction but a small reduction is a huge difference to the poverty estimate. Um, okay, so the present uh, <coughs> level of uh, actual poverty, of actual deprivation in our country would be even higher. One sentence, and I'm winding up. Sorry I've taken so much of your time. Um, because we know that the latest 2017-18 report has been uh, actually suppressed by the government. It shows for the first time, of course, real expenditure on food had been falling. That is, expenditure of food adjusted for the consumer price index. That's what we call real economic parlance, though I don't think that that is very real still, is an overestimate. But that had been falling for a very long time now. But for the first time, the real expenditure per capita on all goods and services, not only food, has shown a decline. And that is why people have kind of woken up and said, well, what is happening? You know? But they should have woken up, in my opinion, 20 years ago because the data were very clear about what was happening there. So, last sentence, the long-term solution in my opinion for developing countries, including ours, is not the promotion of labor displacing capitalist agriculture, because our displaced peasants have nowhere to go to, but to ensure the viability of small-scale production, which continues to be the main source of livelihoods for the majority, and ensuring living wages for rural as well as urban workers. A reversal of income deflating fiscal and monetary policies and protection to farmers through price stabilization measures combined with the provision of affordable credit are all eminently feasible. Reaping the benefits of economies of scale and improving livelihoods require that small scale units of peasant and artisan production enter into voluntary cooperation. Some successful experiments have been undertaken already, which point the way to hopefully a more viable future. Thank you very much. Sorry to have taken so much. Time.